Welcome to this webisode on stability. Our world today is marked especially by instability, especially during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic era. The instability of our times is worldwide. Today we are experiencing instability of business. Those of you who run business enterprises like hotel, literaries, malls and department stores, you know what I mean by instability of business. Our world today is marked by instability of health, especially with the threat, the fatal threat of COVID-19 pandemic. There is also the instability of jobs especially those of you who are just part-timers and uh, contractual and uh, non-regular employees. And because of the instability of job, no work, no pay, there is the instability of the sustenance of your families. It seems instability is everywhere right now. Even in the church, there is instability. Instability of doctrine. The present Pope seems to like changing so many traditions of the Catholic faith. Making Catholic believers unstable in their faith convictions and persuasions. Don't you notice the instability of clerical life and religious life or consecrated life? While well, a good number of priests are leaving the priesthood and a good number of religious consecrated persons are leaving their convents, their consecrated lives. We notice above all this instability in the family, instability of family life, broken homes, separated husbands and wives, children not knowing the love of a father, the support of a father, and the tender love of a mother. Oh, everything seems to be unstable now. Even absolute truths are being questioned. Relativism in philosophy and theology are coming in. So how do we fare in this kind of world which is marked by instability? The reply, the witness of monks of the monastic life is the vow of stability. Right in this chapel, many years back, I pronounced solemnly and publicly my vow of stability. 
and this is what I'm going to take up with you. What does this vow of stability mean, and how does it impact our world marked by instability today? The relationship of the monk to the abbot, his spiritual father, is the relationship of obedience. We talked about that yesterday. And this relationship constitutes the principle of monastic community life. This relationship of obedience, obedience of the monk to his spiritual father, the abbot, serves a double purpose, the first of which is educative, and the second is ascetical. The educative purpose means the spiritual formation of the monk. Spiritual formation of the monk. And this is being provided by his spiritual father, the abbot. The ascetical purpose is the mortification of the monk's selfish tendencies, selfish proclivities, selfish inclinations and these forms of selfishness lie lie inside the monk for a lifetime educative obedience extends to a certain limit of the monk's life, a certain limit of the monk's life. It can be relatively enduring and ceases when the monk has attained spiritual maturity. So that's uh, educative obedience. And how do we know? How does he know that he has sort of attained spiritual maturity when he has come to the unity stage of the spiritual life? And by the way, according to spiritual masters, the spiritual life has three stages. The first is the purgative, the second is the illuminative, and the third is the unitive. And so when the monk has come to the stage of unity of the spiritual life, then he can cease. To be oh, educatively obedient. A statical obedience is absolutely permanent. And the monk must persevere in ascetical obedience until his last breath. Saint Benedict gives to this perseverance in ascetical obedience the name of stability. Stability includes not only the actual perseverance, but also the intention to persevere in it till death. So I hope you can see the meaning of uh, stability in this context. Now let's go back to the 
Desert Fathers. You will recall, as I told you in my other conferences, the Desert Father lived as a solitary in his cell within the Laura, the village of hermits. And for life, he bound himself to this kind of life, for life. That was his profession. Without legal document obliging him to do so, and without graded preparations required. He was to stay in silence and in solitude in his cell. To be a hermit. And he had to go through the routine of the spiritual exercises as well as the demands of daily living. These solitaries, these hermits, had one overriding temptation in life. And what is that? To go out of the cell and to seek a break from the cell and routine. And this temptation was chronic. It is called instability a sign of or indication of what I described in my other conferences as a seja, that noonday devil. Now, if the hermit must stay put in his cell, in his hermitage, the Cenobite, the monks living in community, must stay in the Cenobium, meaning to say, in the monastery. So, that's the lifetime of uh, the Cenobite monk. And like the hermit, his uh, overriding temptation is to go out of the monastery to seek a break from the monastic routine and community life. Now, St. Pacomius legislated that the monk must remain in the monastery where he made his profession. Must remain. That's St. Pacomius. But St. Basil even went further by saying that a monk who leaves the monastery for the world is not only unstable but is an apostate. See? So that's the hermit and that's the Cenobite. The hermit has to stay inside his cell all his life, while at the same time going through the routine of the daily exercises, including his daily living. The Cenobite must stay in the monastery all his life. Well, St. Basil must have been really hard and harsh because, as he said, those who leave the monastery are apostates. Now, how does St. Benedict look at stability? The Hermes look at it as committing themselves for a lifetime stay in the cell, given, of course, the other things that they have to do outside the cell for a living. 
the Cenobite, the Cenobitic monk, must stay in the monastery all his life. And St. Pacomius legislated that he must remain in the monastery where he made his profession. But St. Basil was harder and uh, more harsh. He said that the monk who leaves the monastery is an apostate. Now, St. Benedict demands of the person entering the monastery to commit himself to perseverance in obedience. See? In obedience. If you have a copy of the rule of St. Benedict, read chapter 58 and chapter 60 on. And Benedict says, even when he meets with difficulties, contradictions, and even any kind of injustice, he should endure without growing weary or running away. The guy who ran away, what do you say of yourself? Perseverance in obedience with all the trials it entails is the essence of stability. So perseverance in obedience for all the difficulties, trials, uh, humiliations, and even injustices at times. Perseverance in obedience is the essence of stability. It forms the monk to stand alone in firmness, in constancy and consistency. And this is what is called stabilitas cordis, the stability of the heart, the stability of the inner person, which the ancient monks spoke about. So I hope you get the primary meaning of stability, perseverance in obedience. And this is inner stability, stability of the heart. The secondary meaning of obedience, of stability rather, is stabilitas loci, stability of place or local stability or the stability in the community of profession. And this local stability, the stabilitas loci, postulates physical permanence in the monastery, physical And this kind of stability, physical stability, normally conditions the stability of the heart, which is perseverance in obedience until death. Now Benedict speaks about the bonum obediencia, the goal of obedience. The good or benefit which accrues from obedience in its primary and secondary meaning is the death blow to the monk's self-will and selfish inclinations. In this mortificative aspect of obedience, there is the paramount need for perseverance. Okay? Oh, how can somebody say, 
I have a monastic vocation and he goes through the clothing, the investiture, and after several months or a year or so, and then say, no, I have no more monastic vocation, nonsense. In the last paragraph of the prologue, St. Benedict associates perseverance in obedience to patience. Patience. And this is the last sentence of the prologue. Thus, never departing from his school but persevering in the monastery according to his teaching until death, we may by patience share in the sufferings of Christ and deserve to have a share also in his kingdom. That's the last sentence of the, uh, rule, the prologue of the role of St. Benedict. Now, now, what is patience? Patience is derived from the Latin verb pati, P-A-T-I, which means to suffer. Patience, therefore, in its original meaning is suffering. And stability, of course, entails suffering. Now, where are the patients? They're in the hospital, of course. Generally, they are there, suffering from different kind of ailments. And when they are not confined in hospitals, they are called outpatient. So, patients is suffering. Suffering in, day in and day out, the inevitable crosses, trials, difficulties, problems, disappointments, which are part of the vicissitude of monastic life. And the monk unites his suffering to the suffering and death of Christ, made daily in the, made present daily in the conventual mass. Perseverance until death is the monk's share in the suffering and death of Christ, a share that hopefully will lead, will lead him to share in the final kingdom to come. Actually, when we... Uh, don't uh, have that uh, stability of heart and its uh, physical condition, stability of place. It's because we don't want to suffer. While well, somebody told me, I am not happy in the monastery. I don't even have experiences of joy and consolation. You did not come to the monastery, I told him, to be happy and to enjoy. You came to the monastery to share in the sufferings and death of Christ. You didn't come to the monastery for some kind of a pleasure trip or pleasure stay. In uh, the concluding sentence of chapter 4, on the tools of good works, we read, 
Now, the workshop in which we shall diligently execute all these tasks is the enclosure of the monastery and stability in the community. Enclosure in the monastery and stability in the community. Now, one of the signs is when you, when someone is looking for, uh, you know, the pleasures of the world, like going to movies, going to parties, and uh, whiling away time with friends. And does not enjoy the enclosure of the monastery and stability in the community, then something must be wrong. The stable monk will be ever happy to stay home in the cloister. I have some friends who are hermitesses in Amlang La Union. The one who started this uh, hermitical life at the mountain top in the barangay of Ang Amlang, Rosario, La Union, was a Benedictine sister. She stayed in the Benedictine Abbey for 22 years as an active sister, but she never went out of the cloister and she does not even know how vegan looks like compared to some of the nuns who are going up every now and then. So the workshop of persevering obedience and patience is the monastery, the cloister. And the stable monk will love to stay in the cloister. And with the help of the cloister, with the help of the enclosure, the stable monk will see to it that his interior stability, the stabilitas cordis, which is perseverance in obedience, perseverance in patience, perseverance in suffering, that this will grow more firm more constant and more loving day by day until he reaches the end of his journey. So the workshop is the monastery. And like any work done in the workshop, perseverance in obedience and in patience, in suffering, is not instant. It has to be learned day by day. And like anything, it grows. It grows more firm, more stable, more constant, more consistent, and more loving day by day until the end of one's journey. So that's 
the vow of stability. For monks, especially belonging to the Benedictine tradition, this is the fourth vow that has to be made. Besides poverty, chastity, obedience, then there is the vow of stability, understood as the stability of the heart, namely perseverance in obedience, and this perseverance in obedience postulates patience, and patience means suffering. A monk who is looking for joys and consolations, has not learned this stability of heart, perseverance in obedience, in, suffer, in patience, and in suffering. Well, let me share with you an experience I had. It was June 9, 2015. At 4.30 in the morning, I was going up to the third floor of the building to switch on the internet connection for my uh, uh, mass. Well, my mass then was six in the morning, we had to transfer it to the, to six in the afternoon because we found out that uh, the afternoon mass is more conducive to many followers of my Facebook mass. When I got to the third floor, I had difficulties in breathing and experienced chase chest pains and the difficulty in breathing and chest pains were accompanied by profuse perspiration I knew something was wrong I had to be rushed to the doctor's north side doctor's hospital and after several uh, 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 procedures. The cardiologist told me it's heart attack. Heart attack as in heart attack. So they gave me the preliminary uh, uh, medicative measure but then my cardiologist advised me to go to the heart center for angiogram. I was hesitant to go, but then I was finally persuaded to go to the heart center. There I underwent angiogram, and the doctor who did the procedure found out that three arteries of my heart were blockaded, which means you must have gone, you must have underwent three heart attacks, Father, he said. <clears throat> the first and the second, you were not aware, but this third one, you were very much aware because of the symptoms chest pains, difficulty in breathing, and profuse perspiration. And the only remedy is uh, bypass. And so he told me what to do and what to prepare. And I told the cardiologist at the heart center, oh, I just wait for my final end. And uh, I'll just suffer the consequences of this heart attack. Because I had in mind to offer them together with the sufferings of Jesus to be uh, 
united with his uh, the mass, which is the making presence of the sacrificial uh, death and dying of Jesus on the cross. But the cardiologist said, oh, I know, but there is no other way. Medication will not do. Well, anyhow, I was told by the cardiologist, in case, Father, you change your mind, you can always come back to the heart center. So I went home, I came back to Ilocosur, and uh, after a day or so, I went to my cardiologist here at the doc Northside Doctors Hospital, and he studied very well the results of the angiogram. And he asked me what was my decision. I said, no, I'm not. I, w I decided not to go through the bypass surgery doctor. And maybe I just settle for medication and endure whatever may be the uh, concomitants of this experience of heart attack. But my cardiologist here restudied and restudied the results of the angiogram. And in the end, he said, okay, medication will do. And I was so delighted and so happy. And then he showed me the negative of the angiogram. Look, Father, all around your heart, there grew secondary arteries which make up for the three arteries of your heart that were blockaded. Let's hope after quite some time the three major arteries will open up. And can you imagine my joy and my excitement and I told the doctor Doctor, only God can do that. Medicine, doctors cannot let grow secondary arteries around my heart. What's the point? We are willing to go through. The perseverance in obedience which entails much patience and much suffering. God, even in the here and now, gives us some kind of joy that human power, human ingenuity cannot produce. Now, let's talk about the implication of stability or instability in our life today. And this is what I've been trying to get across to you following my masses at the Facebook and my daily faith education. They are now downloaded at the YouTube. I hope to go live at the YouTube. And that's why I've been asking for your help by your subscription to the YouTube in the hope that I can bring more of God's teachings and words of life to you. Today, there is fear to make permanent commitments either in marriage or in the priestly religious life. The fear to make permanent commitments. The 
those of you who are married. In yesteryears, you signed a paper after the sacramental celebration of marriage in the church. And that paper was called Marriage Contract. After quite some time, the name of that paper was changed into Marriage Certification. I do not know what will be the next name given to marriage after another change. I suppose you must have heard the joke that the paper you are holding is not a marriage contract, neither is it a certification of marriage, but until further notice. Until further notice of maybe the annulment or whatever of your marriage. There are some, maybe not really very many, who are going through what they call trial marriage. A man and a woman live together. Let's try it for one year or so, whether we can be compatible or not. And if we are not compatible, we'll simply break off. The fear to make permanent commitment or the end thing now is live in a man and a woman who allege themselves to be in love with one another they just live in without the benefit of marriage either civil or sacramental Underlying these practices is what I observed today, the fear to make permanent commitments. Even in the priestly life, in the religious life, oh, there have been so many priests who have you know, thrown away their priesthood. But was that not a permanent commitment made, that ordination? In the Immaculate Conception School of Theology, they held an academic function, and it was about priestly departures. One of their products, who studied sociology in the University of the Philippines, UP, wrote as his doctoral dissertation in sociology, priestly departures. And he gave the many instances of priesthood, left the priesthood, and the various motives and reasons why they left. And when Archbishop Abaya, who was then the Archbishop of Nueva Segovia, who is the head of that uh, uh, Immaculate Conception School of Theology, because he is the residential bishop of the Archdiocese where the seminary is located. And he said, you are not yet priests. You are only preparing yourselves to be ordained priests and now you talk about priestly departures. Unfortunately, the dean of that school of theology in the years ahead left.
the religious life, whether the male or the female religious, the men and the women will, oh, many more have left. The Exodus was more remarkable during the time of Pope Pius, Pope Paul VI, rather, Paul VI. Thousands left the priesthood, the religious life. Well, there are also a very, very rare cases of bishops. Today there is also the abhorrence of routine. Routine. Especially among the young, they abhor routine. The same schedule from waking up to retiring day after day. There was a nurse who came here for spiritual direction. She has been working as a nurse in New York. And now she tells me she wants to become a contemplative nun. And she said she was willing to leave her profession and ask me for addresses of contemplative communities here in the Philippines. So I gave her. And in her search, she opted to end up trying the Carmelite uh, convent, the Carmel. She went to see the prioress of the Carmel in Baguio, asking to en enter as an observer of the life of Carmel there. And the prioress asked how, how old was she? She was of mature age in her uh, middle thirties. And the prioress, prioress told her, there's no need to come and observe our life. Let me just tell you my daughter, our schedule from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed. And this, 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 this outline the schedule. And this the same schedule day by day until the end of our life. But today there is an abhorrence of routine. But you see, routine is one of the potent arms of stability. Today the world is marked, is noted for its characteristic of change, rapid, constant, ongoing. And the answer of the monastic life to this characteristic of change is stability. Today there is an urge for postmodern man, for novelties and variations in fashion, in hairdo, in music, oh, in lifestyle, in foods and drinks, jobs and employment, etc variations. The answer of the monastic life 
to this urge of modern man for novelties and uh, variations is stability. Today there is also a growing impatience for the state of affairs of families, schools, nations, social institutions, and even church life. Growing impatience, which is the exact opposite of patience. And this impatience affects the inner man, shaking him, making him unstable and inconstant and inconsistent. The answer of the monastic life to this growing impatience for the state of affairs of life today is stability. Perseverance in obedience, in patience, and in suffering. Especially for us Filipinos, the Ningas Kogon culture is very dominant. What is this kogon? It's, uh, a, fi it's a, a plant that can easily catch fire. And the kogon can be set on fire in few seconds, but it can also be, you know, controlled in a matter of seconds too. I remember when one evening at the Trappist Monastery in Hordan, Gimaras, well, we, we retire at quarter to seven, and around 10 o'clock in the evening, and there was fire, very big fire, around the, the buildings of the monastery. Well, it seemed it was very close, but uh, it was really quite far. By the way, the area of the Trappist Monastery, the Trappist Abbey in Ordan Gimaras is 200 hectares. Maybe somebody threw his cigarette butts among the, the grass, the Kogon, and uh, the whole area of Kogon was set on fire. And we were 22 then in the community. So we all rushed out at about 10.30 in the evening. And we got hold of any branch of trees, etc., just to put off the fire. And imagine the 22 of us surrounding that area, which was caught on fire. While well, we were able to put off the fire in no time, so the Ningas Kogon culture of the Filipino, the impetuosity to always begin, 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 and drop things down somewhere at the middle, and nothing is achieved. Well, in the Archdiocese of Nueva Segovia, where I am, I don't know, maybe in other dioceses and archdioceses in the Philippines, the complaint of the lay people is, well, the Church of Nueva Segovia always begins, 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 and somewhere at the middle it stops and drops things down and nothing is achieved. We all 
We're always beginning. The church is always beginning and it stops at the middle and nothing is achieved. Not to mention there is no thrust or direction of the ministry. The answer of the monastic life to this Ningas Kogon culture is stability, perseverance in obedience, which entails patience and patience entailing suffering. What else do we notice about human life? There is the inertia to settle down for the minimum and to be contented with it. This is the minimalistic approach to life. Minimum and to be contented with it. Well, from 1964 on, I had always been teaching either in the classroom setting or in conferences and seminars, in retreats, recollections, and in faith education like this that I'm giving to you every morning at 10 during this uh, quarantine period occasioned by the COVID-19. And as a teacher, I always set a high degree of ideal to those who have been teaching. For instance, in the classroom setting, I would demand of my students to give me a work that would be equivalent to a grade in the line of nine. I know they won't make 